Hello and welcome to the 26th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Saturday the 12th of October 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue with Chapter 8, Political Consciousness, and get into the weeds on the role of the Communist International and critique Lenin's revolutionary strategy. This week I have the new patron Matthew Whitman to thank. If you'd like to help out the show, you can join the Patreon gang gang for as little as $5 a month, which works out at $1 an episode. Patrons get special bonus episodes, the right to vote on the reading group series and other cool stuff too. When we reach 100 patrons, we'll be producing a second Patreon-only podcast every month. It's our first anniversary of being on Patreon this week, so as a special offer, all new patrons for the rest of the month of October will get a free exclusive from Alpha to Mega badge, assuming of course they stay at Patreon for at least six months so I don't get shafted on the postage and packaging. The next reading group series is also not too far off, so make sure you get yourself a copy of Marx's The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon so you can follow closely and point out exactly where we've gone wrong. I'm halfway through reading it myself right now and it's a goddamn humdinger. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. We have a fairly full panel here today. We have got the main man himself all the way from Iran via Philadelphia or something like that. Puya, how's it going? Hey, Tom, how are you? It's uh, Detroit. <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> I all... Did you say this was number 16? And It's, it's 17. Is it 16? Oh, we always talk know. about where I'm from in the beginning. We'll get it someday, Puya. Yeah, yeah. it's all good. Now, next we have Lexi. Lexi, how's it going? Oh, hello there. Doing all right. Visiting a friend in the city, so just chilling in a nice air-conditioned apartment in the Upper West Side. I used to live in the Upper West Side. Whereabouts? Oh, no shit. Um, Let's see. We're on, like, 103. Oh, okay, yeah. West 103. I used to live on West 75th Street and Riverside. Oh, no shit. Yeah, I used to live on the Lower West Side, you know, a couple of real estate markets ago. Is this in uh, New York? New York, New York. So good they named it twice. Now, and finally we have, we've got Kyle from General Intellect Unit all the way from somewhere in Canada. Canada is a very big country, so let's just say Canada. Yeah, How's it going, I mean, Kyle? who could say, right? Like, it's it's just, just, just indeterminate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'm here. I'm ready. Let's narrow it down here a bit. Are you living in, a, in tundra or non-tundra? Non tundra. I, I I am in a place that is similar to tundra, but not quite tundra. Is it the wow. steppe? It's like it's a lot like the steppe, actually. Yeah, it's it's the prairies. Yeah. All right, a man of taste. See, no tundra. <laughs> hey, Tom. <laughs> Kyle, I have a question for you. Then, around where you live, are there many tundra cats? No. Not at all. No, there's no, uh, there's no big cats around here. Uh, uh, we used to have like a lot of mountain lions uh, in my hometown, uh, but not here. I-, I was trying to make a very bad joke about the cartoon Thunder Thundercats. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see <laughs> Thundercats. I was asking. Okay, oh, no. I thought you were just making a dad joke, and then Kyle took it seriously. Uh, no, that's so. It's a real thing. So classic. He reversed. Me. He uh, cannot read a dad joke. <laughs> he did the reverse sarcasm on me. God damn it. Yeah, god damn it. Okay. <laughs> Lost an amazing irony. It's a, uh, you're down some mine shaft. Very irony. Right, now, here we are. <laughs> Today, we're in chapter eight. We had a bit of a break for the last few weeks because we were all doing random different things, going on holidays and such like. So we're back and we're in chapter eight, which is on political consciousness. And we're going to get into this part here where he talks about the importance of symbolic 
unity. So this is, he was talking earlier about how the, I think the second international was a, an international of symbols. And let's see why he thinks this thing is so important. Lexi, how do you feel like a bit of a read? I, I like a bit of a read. The importance of symbolic unity. The second international offered mainly symbolic unity of the international workers movement. But this symbolic unity was profoundly important to the development of workers' parties in individual countries. This point is clearest at the fringes. In Britain and the United States, May Day became, in the 1890s, the focus of the early stages of development of class political consciousness after the later 19th century sloth of pure trade unionism. And in the early 20th century, the connection to the Second International pushed the more advanced trade unionists towards politics and the socialist groups towards unity. Similarly, relations to the international movement pushed French, Italian, and Russian socialist groups towards unity in a single party, actively encouraged by the Kautskyan leadership. And the single party then advanced class political consciousness at a level that the divided socialists could not. There are no doubt other examples. In fact, the same is true in Germany itself. In 1875, Liebknecht wrote a Lasallian program for Gotha, perhaps imagining that this was necessary to achieve unity. In reality, the Lasallian General Association of German Workers was desperate for unity and would have accepted it on any terms. It had been losing ground to the, quote, Marxist Eisenachers because of its hostility to broad trade unions, its dictatorial internal regime, and the Eisenachers' clear opposition to the imperial state, which had been expressed by their MPs' refusal to vote for war credits in 1870. The Eisenachers' roughly democratic character, support for trade unions, and internationalism were all legacies of the First International. He's trying to make the case that the, because the international focus on, you know, kind of sim symbols of unity, that it was particularly important. Is that a reasonable argument? I think it undersells what's going on underneath the symbolic unity. But I've been making the case throughout this book that McNair is, in a way, maybe presenting something that's cut off from the causes. And I'm inclined to read him charitably as not just saying that, you know, the symbolic thing is the most important. All we need to do is establish some, some symbolic unity and we can get back here. But the emphasis on this is a little, I don't know. I'm not sure what to say about that. I have more feelings about the way that he draws out the legacy from the first international to the second international. I think there's like some historical evidence he points to to show that like the actual like secretarial activities of the Second International were somewhat limited to to be like oh that's why it's symbolic unity because it's, they weren't actually doing a lot of administration internationally. I guess there was an underlying social process that was rather similar in each of these countries even though it had a national orientation and even though the Second International didn't take as much administrative tasks as the First or the Third Internationals, is I guess what I mean. I would be interested to know more about, like, outside of the secretarial activities of the International, what the sort of nation-to-nation, -nation, party party-to-party relationships were at that time. Because, yeah, that those were probably quite significant as well. Yeah, I was wondering what he meant by symbolic unity instead of, like, just regular unity and i think that's what he means like that the national parties were still kind of like dispersed you know yeah because i think he's talking about the international in a very like different sense to the way he was talking about party earlier right like with with a party it was kind of like this loose sort of thing it's like it's not necessarily highly institutionalized but i think in this case he's, he's talking about the actual institution of the Second International, not the broader sort of quote-unquote party that formed at that time. At least that's that's kind of my read based on the fact that like he's pointing to 
kind of like secretarial activities is like a, a major part of what does or does not make it symbolic. There's a line here I just want to read again because this one, I just realized I've written some notes in my hand copy about it. Let me just read it again. It had been losing ground. This is talking about the, I think, the Lasallians in, in Germany in the 1870s. And he says here, the Lasallians were the ones that were trying, they kind of the right wing of, of social democracy or Marxism or socialism, whatever you want to say it. It had been losing ground to the Marxist Eisenachers because of its hostility to broad trade unions, its dictatorial internal regime and the Eisenachers' clear opposition to the imperial state, which had been expressed by their MPs' refusal to vote for war credits in 1870. Like, that's just been slipped in there. There's very little actually talked about that. That is a major goddamn point in this book. Yes. Like, it's an enormous, it's enormous. point. That in 1870, they got the war credits right. And in 1914, they didn't. Right. All the way through the book, it seems to me there is a case being made that, like, they couldn't have voted against war credits in 1914 on some, for some, like, the reason is that the right made it impossible. Yeah, they blocked with the right. No, that's, that's what changed between 1870 and 1914. They're like, all right, the right. Let's hang out, right? And so once they merged, there's no way around it. This is this is what Liebknecht was doing at the time, according to McNair. But I don't know if that's true. It's making the point that because it happened then, it had to have happened. I just don't buy that. You, you don't buy that if they block with the right, then that has to happen. I don't, I don't buy that. I, I, I don't buy that. Say, for example, like... It is possible for large parties, for example, the Labour Party in Britain in the 60s to not go to war in Vietnam. It is possible. You know, I just think that that is, you know, people read into these things like these are iron laws. I don't think they are. If they're able to do it in 1870 and I don't think it was impossible for them to do it in 1914. But in in 1870, the state didn't have a a say within their party. And when you have a nationalist loyalist right, the state has a say in your party. And once the state gets a, a say in your party, that's an institution that's lasting, you know, hundreds of years, they're going to out-organize you. It's going to happen. Like you need to have your own agency apart from the state. But why in why in the 1960s did the US to the British Labour Party not go in with America in Vietnam and they did in so many of them how is it possible that they didn't that time and they did in other ones because it was plausibly not in the interest of the British state <laughs> but it's plausibly not in the interest of the British state way more plausibly probably to not go into Iraq in 2004 but but we're, we're making this a little too general. We're just talking about the right having the nationalists having a block within the socialist party. You know, in, inside of a you know a revolutionary you know communist like you know group, if you invite in the state, they're going to have a, a veto power over internal decision making. This is a token of a type. It's not necessarily that every war is going to go through. Does that make sense? I know what you're saying, but I disagree. That's my kind of basic point. Sure, that's yeah, cool. like, uh, like that. I, I think that there is pressure, definitely, if you get the right in. But just like there is pressure on the moment with Jeremy Corbyn from the right to ditch certain policies. But like, here's an alternative universe, one that I don't think is impossible, one that I think that's reasonably likely. Maybe it's not as likely as what happened. The left of the party or the centre do not do credits like they did in the 1870s. They've got institutional memory of, of that and what it meant. And uh, the right splits for them from a point of weakness and that they maintain their strength. To me, that's a very plausible outcome. Much like it is in, if you see what's happening with, say, Jeremy Corbyn here in, in Britain, how the right are always putting these ultimatums and he doesn't back down and they're left in disarray. Some of them splinter and the right are weak. It, to me, it's not an iron law that what happened in 1870 could not have happened in 1914. And if anything, what does it teach? It should be teaching like political strategists of the left that, you know, these war decisions 
are incredibly important. And if you give the right, the the whip hand or whatever you want to say it, that will haunt the party. Like, look at the debates, the US presidential debates, the Democratic ones. To this day, it's, not, it's 15, 16 years since the Iraq war. And it's one of the major issues. War, these war votes. This should be like a fucking, a core tenant of political strategy. Never vote for a war unless somebody's invading you. It's just simple as that. And it, it, it splits parties. It's essentially split the Labour Party. There's no way Jeremy Corbyn could have gone into power if the Iraq war couldn't have happened. No way. Fine, but in the law, it's not an iron law in that in every token instance that the right will necessarily outflank you. But as an iterated process within capitalism, there is a tendency, a strong tendency, that you will not invite the state into your house and then, you know, keep control in the long run. It won't happen. What is the labor's current position on NATO? Because, like, that seems like a similar sort of problem, right? Correct. Uh, Corbyn has backed down on some stuff. Like, what he would have, what his personal points are not what the party's points are. Okay. So, you know, so, like, his the position on Trident, renewing Trident, renewing the nuclear submarines, they pretty much capitulated there. But, like, right. the, 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 so, like, but the thing is there is that, like, it's not like, Corbyn is at the position of strength that the SPD were. The left and the SPD were a dominant part of that party. Not, I don't know dominant, but a major, major part. So, like, the room for someone like Corbyn, I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to make the case that Jesus Corbyn's brilliant. I'm just making the case that I just do not think the 1914 vote was, was inevitable. I, I think that a complicating factor to the 1914 vote was that a plausible case could be made that this was a uh, effort of national defense, of self-defense. Uh, that was an argument that was made and there was like textual evidence brought in from, I think, like Engels to, to say like, okay, this is something that is like coherent with a Marxist program because of the way that the, the war started, right? And so that, I think, made it more difficult to split with the right. Not to say it was impossible, but it did complicate the matter even more. Like, certainly the start of the, the Franco-Prussian War was also rather complicated. So, like, the fact that the, that, that the Eisenachers, like, voted against that uh, was, like, really impressive. It's a bit frustrating because this is something I sort of agree with the overall, like, Leninist thrust on and I don't necessarily end up I guess taking it where I gather McNair does but if you do take this on if you do think that inviting the state into your camp creates a just a long-term strategic problem that you have to split to overcome it has it has grave implications this is what leads people to either become left comms left-wing communists abstentionists to just wash their hands altogether or to attempt some kind of splitting the difference. And this is really where a lot of the crank stuff is. Right. Like, I guess you could be a, you could be a crank Democrat or something. But honestly, all Democrats are crank Democrats now. Center left, which was always like the, you know, super rational blah, 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 is, you know, drawing circles on chalkboards and stuff. So. Yeah. I think everybody in this conversation so far would agree that this kind of war decision is something that would require a split, right? Like, I don't think we're in disagreement about that. Like, it would split the party. Yeah, no, I think, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, it's about, we've discussed this earlier, and this is, like, I keep harping on it, so maybe this is my kind of critique of this book, is that, you know, you're better off letting the other people split than you split. And if you're voting no for a war, makes the right split from you remember like if you look at the labor party today say in just looking at the dynamics of how these splits go on it's not like all the right split they didn't right no more than all the left split from the spd when they voted for it some split it 
So like, say for Jeremy Corbyn right now, some of the right will split, but most of the right stays in and they shut their mouth. And I think that's what will happen. That's what would have, say, theoretically, whatever, happened in 1914, that many rightists would have split, but the vast majority would have stayed in and shut their mouth. If you're, if we're literally talking about ever having a party, ever having a party that's of any fucking meaningfulness that it could ever lead to, like what we're talking about in this book, a majority. We have to have a strategy that can deal with these issues. And you have yeah, to be that, fully prepared and aware of it. That, that can resist the incentive structures of, of the society. Yeah, there's always, there's always pressures. It's like playing goddamn Texas Hold'em. Position matters. If you're out of position, you're at a disadvantage all the time. And you're going to have, you're going to realize less equity in the hand. It's just a mathematical law. And similarly, if you're, if we're dealing with trying to get a large party from a left radical point of view, you're going to be at disadvantages at certain, you know, the structural disadvantages that you can't do about. But you've got to have your counter strategy. You've got to understand what the disadvantage is and understand the strategies to minimize those things. That's just the way I'm looking at it. I'm not trying to be like... No, I... I have common ground here because there is a structuralist Marxist thing to do, which is to roll your eyes at anybody entering into these structures and then making the right calls. Because right. once the in once the incentives are in place, betrayal, schmetrayal, there's no such thing. It's just, you know, one billiard ball hitting another. There's nothing you can do about it, which it, political agency requires not thinking like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. But and, yeah. How did the Russian Revolution ever get off the ground if that was correct? You know, well, it couldn't. Right, but but the question is, how far does well the the Russian Revolution predates a lot of capitalist, uh, like 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 especially highly developed capitalist uh, parliamentary dynamics, which was part of what the left wing communists would harp on Lenin about, being like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. Like, it's so different here. Like, you you don't get it. Lenin's like, why is everyone so obsessed with sex there and stuff? They're just reading magazines. He's just, he didn't understand what it was like to be in like late capitalism, you know, or even 19, you know, 10s German capitalism. It's a qualitatively different situation. Not all, not all the incentive structures were, had been capitalist and there for, you know, a century or something. I'm, I don't know. But the the right. point is, is that once those incentive structures are in place, there are certain kinds of actions that are, you know, traitorous, but are to basically be expected to the point where you can't have your moral outrage go off anymore because it's a waste of energy. So where we agree is that I don't accept that we live in a totally structurally determined place and we have to like really delimit how far that goes. I'm not trying to be a dirty idealist, <laughs> you know, and saying not. The, the vote could have been different, but I, I do think like there is agency in these things. And I do think while you're at disadvantage and while this is every time a war vote could would come up, it would very put large stress to a, any kind of a revolutionary communist socialist party that the, the learning would be always not to shift to the right in these situations. And the thing is, like, it's like you have to educate your own members and educate them before a war ever happens about the dangers of it like every war nearly apart from apart from world war Two, has nearly been has caused like massive splits in the left in all the different countries that they've happened the major ones you know 1914 1870 these ones they had the propensity to to do massive s splits uh, so it's like I think that uh, you know the Iraq war the Vietnam war then just take your take your pick it's just repetitive again every time war is the one that really causes shit to hit the fan and it's just something that i don't know it just stuck out to me that this one line where they say oh they didn't vote for it then and then the whole book is saying oh yeah but you, everybody must vote for it and i know the right wasn't in the party to the same extent but it doesn't i that's what he agrees with lenin on he yeah he's a neo kautskyist whatever like he ultimately doesn't think that like any variant of a general strike strategy or a left strategy or a quote sub bakuninist strategy works but he he does think that you know the historic center made this error and that lenin was right about this lenin was i think lenin was right that they made an error but i don't think splitting has been a success 
that the like the that the error in strategy has been not to prepare your party for times of war and what is the way you should deal with it and that's the error as opposed to the vote is the error it's that when you want to build your party to a large size you've got to be fully aware that war is the one thing that will destroy it maybe i'm wrong anyway somebody else say something i'll shut up now i mean i think it's it might be worthwhile to sort of just like clarify what mcnair is saying right is that I think at, at, at the base in this book, he's saying that the working class desires unity for practical reasons, right? Like, it's just a simple fact that numbers are what gives working class politics strength, right? That, like, we don't have the resources, we don't have the money, but we can get together. And if we're unified, we can be powerful. And that desire for working class unity based on good strategic reasons, also leads to party unity, right? There's a drive towards party unity. And I think what McNair is saying is that, like, when you block with the right, that drive for unity is always going to push in favor of the right. And I think that's maybe a point that, like, we disagree on. Because, like, you know, Tom, you're making the point there that, like, well... You know, look at the situation of Corbyn. In that case, there was a split, but you had people on the right who remained in the party on the principle of unity and were actually like strategically disadvantaged. So that is that is distinct from the sort of scenario that McNair is presenting of, well, when you come down to these sorts of decisions, the left is going to fold in order to maintain party unity they will stick with a right leadership given all the incentives that exist yeah correct that's that's precisely my point like my point is that it's very like a kind of a an initial kind of condition to it is you need to have the left of your party somehow come to power like Corbyn fluked into power utterly fluked it (laughs) nobody could believe it you know but he got into power and the difficulty for, say, somewhere like in America will be to get a left into the dominant control of, say, the Democrats. You know, that's a that's a whole other barrel of fish. Well, I mean, that's the perspective from that's my barrel of fish. That's the barrel of fish I live in, Tom. And from, yeah, from our perspective, that's that is. Wow. That's a real long shot. That seems crazier than communist revolution. Yeah, but look, Corbyn, like Lexi, you can't, you like, I, I, I don't mean, I don't mean it pejoratively, but like, you, you can't imagine how unlikely Corbyn becoming the Labour Party leader was. Like, he was my local MP. The guy would turn up to meetings late with a with a plastic bag full of bits of rubbish. Like, it's just, <laughs> I've been there, I've been at a meeting, and he turns up like half an hour, an hour late with a plastic bag with loads of like sheets of paper <laughs> in it, and he's wearing like a a duffel jacket and like. You know, and he's just, you know, all over the place. Not even a good speaker. You just couldn't imagine it. You could, it's just, it's just, it blows my mind when I think about it. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes weird stuff happens, right? But like... No, no, for sure. So like my, my thinking about this is that like, if we wanted to look at which party in history in a major kind of developed capitalist country was the kind of party that could have done something good. And to me, it's the SPD from what I know. Okay. And they were the closest to doing anything that would have been what we would have thought would be what communism or socialism that we want would look like. Now, as like radicals, we should be thinking like, how do we get back into that to that type of party? And how do we get to a party like that? Like, I'm not saying the Labour Party is like the SPD now. But like, I'm just always when I'm reading this book, I'm always just thinking strategy. If I'm a chess player or a poker player what is my strategy to get to that position okay so for me it's like you know it 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 seems like this is a strategy and people can like take it or leave it you know i'm not saying it's correct it's something that just kind of has come up to me again and again reading this book you try and get control of a left party and then you you try and radicalize people with it and you try and use your base like like in the labor party the membership is driving the party to the left. Okay. 
while the the MPs are trying to drive it to the right. And you want to try and constantly make your policies more and more radical all the time. And, and like maybe over like five election cycles, you wouldn't, be, you know, you, maybe your party is actually getting to an SPD party. You, that, that to me is like a plan that somebody could 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 put together like i know like it's failed numerous times and and and, and now i'm sounding like i'm novara fucking media and it, it, it well <laughs> you know it it makes my head melt but like god damn it like the carbon thing is quite interesting i don't know like you know the vast likelihood of it is it'll fall flat in its face like syriza don't get me wrong but all right i don't know i just i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about uh, well, it's you know. worth a shot. It's worth a shot, even though it's against a historical tendency. That's what you're saying. Well, I don't know. Like you said, that um, the membership is always is generally left, while the leadership is right. Yeah, uh, but yeah, there's like, but I'm thinking about like the DSA, and you know their membership isn't really that left, like like relative to the leadership. I don't think. I, when you said that, I was thinking like, uh, is Tom talking about like? Going into the DSA and like making that a left party. Well, the DSA is way to the left of the Democratic leadership part to de- leadership. Yeah, that's my point. I my point is not that the DSA are actual commies. My point is that they are to the left of the leadership, and my point is in Labour Party they are to the left of. Well, they're probably not to the left of Jeremy Corbyn, but they're to the left of the party leadership. You know, like the the MPs, Par- Parliamentary Labour Party. Yes, they're way to the left of them. And like the point is that can you have a kind of a ratchet? Is there some possibility for a ratchet strategy where you have like a feedback loop which ma- makes the membership ratchet more left? The the point that really like comes up to me here is um, that kind of like anti-politics point, the observation about this, the, the state of current party composition that... In the case of Corbyn, uh, you do have like this activist membership that has pushed the party to the left because the right has no actual mass basis. Like they they just are administrators of the state and they have a very tenuous relationship to the population at large. And I doubt that was actually the case with the SPD. Like, I, I think that, like, all of the factions in the party had more of a significant membership backing and more of a significant mass basis than what you see in the contemporary Labour Party, which is quite detached from society and is open to this kind of push. Because the right in the, in the, in the PLP is really a paper tiger, as far as having any kind of mass basis that they could actually bring to bear. Yeah, that, that is what goes on in my head when I think about this. And the anti-politics stuff even makes me question what what relationship the things that people call like the left right now has to, you know, emancipatory Marxian communist politics or whatever. And there is a way that people are getting more and more left wing. And people might use the word communist, they might use the word Marxist, they might use the word socialist. But there's a, you know, a, a substantive, a continued substantive drift away from, I don't even know how to say it without sounding really hack and I, or, or you're silly, but you know, like de- democratic populist values, you know, not small d de- democracy, you know, like people actually having some sense that, I don't know, human beings are capable of decision making. There's an anti-humanist drift where it just goes, I don't know, there's something deeply reactionary about it. About the kind of political actors you get out of a a situation of sort of mass disenfranchisement and disassociation with politics, there's a real control freak, kind of vitriolic sort of declasse tendency in the existing kind of radicals uh, on the left and right and in the political class generally that is is kind of like inherently anti-emancipatory so there's something anti-democratic and anti-proletarian about it that seems it's something it's just something i'm deeply frustrated with and i, I don't 
really know how to get around it. It's just something that complicates it for me when I'm trying to adopt, you know, a worldview that, I mean, Tom, it sounds like if I could adopt that worldview, I could, you know, kind of integrate into reality and, and society more, maybe society more than reality. But like, and it sounds attractive. And I kind of want to believe it, you know? I'm telling you why I can't. <laughs> there's, there's, something, there's something that really seems different about mass politics now that makes me skeptical towards even, you know, just my desire to, like, want to go out and, like, and, and do something in general. Like, it's, there's something, there's a true nausea about it. That if, it affects a lot of reasonable people. Why? I don't know. It's like people are people. And I think people have always been, there's always been a hell of a lot of like disingenuous, scummy people you'd have to deal with in politics. I don't know how much it's worse or different than ever. I would say it's much of a muchness. It's my instinct on it. I, like, I just think like, you know, obviously DSA and, and all these things and the Labour Party will be full of shitty politics as well. But like the shitty politics that's around now is a lot better than it was 10 years ago, you know. It, I just think people are, you know, it's like an awakening of, you know, socialism is like, it's starting to fucking move again. The dynamic is moving. It's probably true. I mean, things were pretty nutty. I don't know. They're different kinds of nutty. They're different kinds of good and different kinds of bad. It is phenomenally weird. So, for example, for example, you don't have as many people who sat, like, I think if you went back 10 years ago on the internet, a lot of people who would be socialists today would have been libertarians 10 years ago for sure definitely now Derek, is that I, you so know Der Der maybe uh, me Derek, I don't, I... right but Derek will grant this and then sort of point out is, is this a hopeful phenomenon or is this tell us something about the sort of level of engagement that we're getting maybe maybe it is a hopeful phenomenon I tend to read it as a hopeful phenomenon I tend to read it that way I think even though there's like this incredible disconnect between this shift in thinking and organizational forms. Yeah, big time. And like, I feel like the state and society really are quite at odds with each other at this right. moment. And like, it's not clear to me that the, the, the shift towards socialism implies some kind of resolution of that dilemma. I do think that the, that the the change in thinking should be read positively. Like, I don't know where it goes, but it, it's, you know, I lived through the 90s. It was bad. It was really bad, you know? Yeah, it seems very far away. Honestly, I'm, or I, I feel that things are better. And I mean, cert things are certainly better on, like, you know, a gender front or whatever since, since, since the, the 90s. But, like... In terms of these, like, fundamental strategic issues, you know, yeah, I mean, there has been, like, a, a change in discourse. There are, like, I mean, it's not from planet Mars to be a socialist in the U.S. And that's a banal point. Hmm. But well, what, do you, what do you mean by socialist, though? What do, you, what do you mean, like, a like a communist or, like, Bernie Sanders? Whatever, whatever. Like, all, all of that was, was kind of, like, Cold War delimited in the 90s. There was like the hangover of the Cold War. You were a traitor in the 80s and the 70s. Or you, you, you were getting laid in the 70s if you were a commie. If you're in the 80s, you're, you're, you're a traitor. And then in the 90s, you're just like, you just don't belong. You're the, the guy on Seinfeld. You're, you're the yeah. guy on the, the Seinfeld episode about communism. Yeah, you're literally a joke. Like, like the Tropico computer game series... They, they have all these, like, shitty, like, you know, it was kind of racist, and, and, and but it, they had all these, like, shitty stereotypes and dumb jokes. They have a communist in it, and the joke is that they're a communist. There's no, like, additional, like, winks, really. It, they just say communist stuff, <laughs> and that's the joke. That's funny. And, like, it is true. Like, like imagine, right? It's 2008, right? YouTube's just been launched, and we're, we're doing a McNair Reading Group series. For a podcast, how many people would listen to that goddamn thing? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that's about that's about when the book was written, right? It was. So it's not even it's not even no time travel involved. YouTube existed. <laughs> but if I did it, it would it, instead of getting like the hundred views it does on YouTube, it would get it would get one. And even in a podcast. 
like there was no left wing podcast in 2008. There was right. probably a hundred libertarians. Now I'd say the socialist or whatever you want to call it, whatever people, to me it's just the term they call it themselves. Even to call themselves socialism is a massive movement in America, not so much in Europe, but in America. And it's like, you know, I, I'm sure it's got to be three to one socialism to libertarian podcast now, as opposed to a hundred to one the other way. It's just got to be. Yeah, libertarianism is, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't encounter it that much in my everyday life. I don't know about you people. Not like I used to. Like, it used to be the degree to which the Fraser Institute was successful in propagandizing in uh, in British Columbia, where I grew up. This was a uh, American libertarian-funded propaganda organ that's existed forever. And they, they like, they produce, like, uh, school book materials and, like, they get a bunch of stuff on the news and just basically exist to drive politics in a libertarian direction. Like that stuff was really pervasive when I was growing up. Uh, and it feels like it's a little, like it's still on the news, but it's not popular in the way it was because it's just, you know, it's just not the zeitgeist, right? Like libertarianism, I feel like is a bit on the wane. I would really like to see the left that's developing right now. Like, thing for me is they're just not like they don't have that push towards like nationalizations and expropriations you know that i would like internationalism is not even i i did had no idea what internationalism was before i uh like it's not a part of the discourse right now at all socialist politics is so nationalistic still these are long movements they're not short movements we i think we'll see it coming you know Corbyn is talking about nationalizing rail and energy, you know, renationalizing the post office, the railways and energy. So if he wins, they're getting re they're nationalized. That's, you know, so it is starting, you know, and they're not going into like the old form of nationalization. They're going to be some democratic control over it. So I mean, like as in non politicians, democratic control. So it's interesting. We'll see what happens. God damn it. It'll go the way of Syriza and it'll fall on its ass. But something is moving. That's the way I just put it. That's the way I feel about it, you know. Look, we've done one page. We haven't even done one page. Seriously. Ah, but, uh, but, but wow, I, I need a cigarette. That was a great, com it's a great conversation about this page. Are, 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 you, are you implying that you've actually come, Lexi, during that discussion? <laughs> is that what you're I'm implying? I'm saying, I feel very satisfied. <laughs> I feel closer to everybody. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Chesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, and Swampside Chats. <laughs> <laughs>